Guten Tag, in this video I'll show you how to make amazing bread with a neglected unfed starter. So the sourdough starter here hasn't been fed in around four days and it remained at room temperature and you can see it even has a little bit of a dry layer here on top. If you look at the container from the edges you can see there's almost no activity, it looks very sluggish. Still we can bake amazing bread with this. The microorganisms in your sourdough starter are still alive, they are still in there. They are starving, however. So they really want to have some food now. The longer we wait, the more inactive they are going to become. And ultimately, they are going to sporulate. And then they'll be ready to hibernate for a long period of time. And the amazing thing is that these yeasts and bacteria live in symbiosis with the plants in nature. That's why when making a starter it's recommended to use a whole flour because you have more natural contamination. This is the same thing I'm using when I'm drying my sourdough starter. By drying it I'm putting a lot of stress on the microorganisms and they know there's no food so we're gonna save ourselves for better times and we will start to sporulate. So this powder here contains millions of spores and this can be reactivated. However, this is gonna take some time to reactivate. Based on my own experience it takes up to three days. So I could use this directly to make a dough, but then the main dough would take around three days to finish. Now three days, that would be too long. The flour water mixture would start to disintegrate. For this reason, if you buy a ready-made dried starter in the supermarket, companies typically always add a little bit yeast to it to speed up the whole process. I'm telling you this because this starter has been fed around three days ago and it stayed at room temperature. So I'm sure that the microorganisms here have not entered this sporulation mode yet. So I can still use this. If I were to wait for a week that might be a little bit too long. Now if you kept your starter in the fridge for a month, fermentation is much slower and chances are you can still use the starter. Some bakers have reported that they baked amazing bread even after a year of leaving the starter unfed inside of the fridge. This of course also depends on the fridge temperature. The lower, the longer the starter stays good. The max limit for this technique is probably going to be around five to seven days at room temperature. One thing that's off though in this starter now is the balance. Normally you have a good balance of yeast and bacteria. As the fermentation continues, we'll have more and more acidity piling up. And the acidity ultimately favors the lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria which are in your starter. So the yeast portion becomes more and more inactive. At the same time, the lactic acid and acetic acid bacteria becomes more active. So now if we use this starter, we sort of have an imbalance of microorganisms. And that's a problem because we'll have more bacterial fermentation compared to yeast fermentation. And this is not something that you would want. Your bread would taste overly sour and you wouldn't have the fluffy texture that makes a wheat-based dough so amazing. But there's a way to fix this. I'm going to show you. When people talk about peak sourdough starter performance, they refer to using a sourdough starter which has a good balance of both yeast and bacteria. I don't worry about this too much because you need to know that your main dough is nothing else other than a big gigantic sourdough starter. So when we are making a dough, we are essentially feeding our sourdough starter, except that we add a little bit of salt to the starter. And now because we have this imbalance that I talked about, it's very important that we don't use too much of this sourdough starter. Our starter will regrow inside of the dough. And to start everything with a good balance, we'll just be using a tiny little bit of this sourdough starter to make a dough. If you had a regular recipe, you might be using something like around 200 grams of sourdough starter for 1000 grams of flour. We'll be going way lower. We'll be using around 5%. That's way less. And if your starter is even older, I would probably go to something even lower, maybe 1%. So for 1000 grams of flour, that would be around 10 grams of sourdough starter. And this way, this balance is going to be achieved again inside of your dough while your dough is being fermented. Your starter is regrowing inside of your main dough. That's the idea. So the older the starter, the more unfed, the lower the amount of starter we use to make an actual dough. If I were to introduce 20% of this now to my main dough, I would be introducing a very, very big imbalance to the dough and I don't want that. At the same time, this flour here has also been fermented for a long period of time, so it doesn't hold together anymore that well. Now there's one problem though, because we're just using a tiny bit of our starter, the fermentation of our dough is going to take a lot longer. Whereas it might take normally six to 12 -ish hours, now this fermentation might take 14 hours or 16 hours. So I best recommend that you make a dough like this during evening times where the dough can ferment overnight and you can check on the dough following the next morning. But don't worry, I have a really cool trick that I'm going to show you later, how we can monitor the fermentation stage. This really makes everything so much simpler. And because the fermentation takes so long, we're also limited in which kind of flour we want to use. If we want to make a wheat-based or spelt-based dough, we need to make sure that we have a flour that can withstand this long fermentation period. So that's going to be a flour which is very strong. 
I have two flowers here and what you want to look at is the amount of protein that you have inside of your flower. The higher this is, the longer the fermentation period is that your flower can withstand. Over time the flower is going to degrade automatically just by being in contact with water. And this flower here even has a little bit more protein, so the higher this value, the longer we can push the fermentation period. Now, this is just for the wheat category, which will create you this fluffy wheat bread. Now, if you're making a bread from another category, let's say rye, emmer, einkorn, then you don't have to care so much about the protein at all because you anyways are going to bake this probably inside of a loaf pan. To make good wheat bread with this kind of starter, you need to make sure that you have a strong flour at hand. Personally, I think rye bread is so underrated. It's so much simpler. The whole process much, 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 much faster, way less hassle. So if you've never made a rye bread, please check out this video. I think you're going to enjoy it a lot. So just to summarize this one more time, we use less starter. The fermentation will be slower and so we need to use a stronger flour. As flour is in contact with water, the flour starts to automatically degrade. And that's because the sprouting process is initiated. The seedling wants to sprout. And so the starch is converted into easier eatable sugars. And this is also actually where the yeast and bacteria hook in. In the end, you're not eating raw flour anymore. You're eating a completely different product. The final bread you're eating is most likely yeast waste and bacteria waste. And that's fermentation. We're converting something into something completely different. So enough theory, let's make a dough now. I'm adding 1000 grams of flour, 20 grams of salt. And this is actually the only difference between a dough and a starter. The starter doesn't have any salt. But based on my own findings now, it might actually make sense to use salt in your starter as well. Just imagine your starter fermenting flour water and then suddenly it's tossed into an environment with salt. It's not trained to handle this. So it would make sense that you replicate the same environment in your starter as in your main dough. This is probably going to be highly controversial, but I would be interested in reading your comments on this topic. I wanted to make a video on why you should feed salt to your starter. Now let's add our starter, our neglected starter. Sorry, Brad Pitt. It's actually important that you give your starter a name or else it's bad luck. I'm just gonna toss a little bit of Brad Pitt in here and I'm using everything I have and the rest, the leftovers, I will put into my discard starter jar. Really, there's no reason for you to waste any starter. This is pure gold. This is a long fermented flour. It's like pickled food. Now I have around 50 grams. That's around 5% in terms of baker's math. That's a good value to use when you have a neglected starter. If it's a warmer where you are, you might even want to go a little bit lower. And one more time, as you can see, these are my leftover bits. I will put them into my discard starter jar. I could use them to make another starter. I could use them to make some sourdough spice, which is excellent for pizza. Seriously, please never waste this. What I'm going to do is the next starter I will make, I will just take a little bit of this dough and use this to make my next starter. That definitely works. Now I'm adding around 700 grams of water. This really depends on the flour you have at hand. And generally, if you have a neglected starter, a lower water value will help to boost the yeast a little bit. That's why a stiff sourdough starter is such a game changer. A stiff sourdough starter has way less water than a regular starter. A regular starter has a water level of one parts of flour, one parts of water. And for the stiff starter, it's one part of flour, half a part of water. And this really boosts the yeast activity very, very much. So I wouldn't recommend to go too high in hydration. Again, this depends on your flour. The lower the hydration, let's say you make a pizza dough or something with, which is even less in hydration, then that's even better. And now I'm just going to mix that with my hands. I'm going to build some dough strength. I have a great video on the topic of kneading, which I'm linking right here. And then I'll show you the dough. And then lastly, we need to talk about how we know that this dough is actually ready. That's coming up next. So our dough has nicely come together and now the question is when is this dough done with the fermentation? Now the bulk fermentation starts because I'm making two breads in a single bulk. That's why it's called bulk fermentation. Because we used so little starter, this is gonna take a while. And that's why time suggestions and recipes don't work because depending on your level of starter activity, your temperature and so on, it always takes a different amount of time. And for this, I recommend that you take a small piece of the dough and then you put this into a shot glass. Ideally something of cylindrical shape. I have a small tube like this that you can use. 
And now we will take a little bit of this dough and place this inside. And the moment this has increased by around 50% in size, we know that the bulk fermentation is complete and we can continue with the next step. Nice. If you use a shot glass like this, which is not of cylindrical shape, I would recommend to wait for around a 25% size increase. And now your dough could be ready in eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, 20 hours, it's no problem. We'll always know depending on the size increase when our dough is ready. This really is a game changer for so many home bakers. Of course, the more experience you get, you will be able to read the size of the dough. Here, there's a little bit of air. You will notice the smell of your dough. So over time, you get used to seeing ready doughs and you can go by look and feel. Another method you could do is you could opt for a pH meter to measure how much acidity is inside of your dough. This is a little bit technical and also quite expensive because you need a good pH meter. If you want to read more about measuring the fermentation and its progress, please check out my free book. It's really completely free. If you feel it's useful, you can drop a small donation, but I want everybody in the world to be able to have this information. That's why I decided to make it completely free. Link is in the description. So let's take a piece of the dough. I like to mark this. 50% size increase, 100% because this flour is relatively strong, I can go up to 100%. The stronger the flour, the longer you can ferment and the more you can push the dough. With a weaker flour, less protein, you shouldn't ferment it as long. And now small bonus clip. Let's make this into a nice, round, smooth dough ball. I think this is the single most important step when making bread almost. And look at this nice surface. It's not sticky. I could play with this dough all day long. Thanks for watching.